Yeah. So I am very excited about this. Uh, and I, I'll start easy, because then I'll start grilling you really hard after that. Uh, we'll start easy with the first question. And, and uh, Pete, we'll, we'll start with you first. Give us one minute and, and tell the audience, if you would, what do you know now, after having been a coach, that you wish you had known when you started? Hmm. One minute? One minute, coach. Wow. I have home field advantage here, by the way. I have like a gong right behind me, too. Um, I think probably, I mean, I'd had a lot of really good coaches growing up. I played a lot of different sports. Uh, Some were really good, some not so good. Uh, Probably the most important thing in terms of uh, a difference is, has nothing to do with X's and O's. It's got to do with, uh, you know, how you deliver the message. And, uh, you know, when I read the book Season of Life a few years ago, uh, it just really helped me because it it made me understand that uh, it's just more than football. And uh, so bottom line, I think, is just how much, how important it is to have relationships with the kids, Mm -hmm. that the kids have relationships with each other, and, you know, the coaching staff as well. Uh, The most important people other than the kids are my coaches, and I've got an unbelievable coaching staff that works with me, and we love each other as well. Uh, You know, we don't always, you know, agree on everything, but we love each other. So I think the whole love thing is really important. I didn't realize that love could be such a motivating force. Yeah, of course. It was all about communication. Um, When I first started playing sports in high school, I'd um, done a few things in middle school, but when I first started playing sports in high school, I was like the odd man out, and I had a very um, incredible coach by the name of Harry Trabig, who coached for Strake Jesuit, and it's one of those men for others again. And he had this way of communicating with us and I use a lot of different things than he uses, but his thing was keep your C, keep your C, keep your C and hold the rope for your teammate. Keep your... Keep your C mean keep your composure at all times. And hold the rope meant you got all these other people to hold the rope for. And his, his example was if you were hanging over a cliff, don't let go. And don't let go for your teammate, not so much for yourself. And it was just this unselfish... Um, attitude that he tried to instill in us and I think that that was the thing that I liked the most uh, about coaching and it inspired me to be a coach and try to learn a vocabulary or another language to speak to kids or to speak to athletes that would make them draw closer to each other. It's great. (laughs) Ursula. As a coach, I make a lot of mistakes. I'll be the first to admit that. Um, But I learn from them. And when I look at a kid, and I I coach high school as well as um, AAU, and it's it's a completely different beast. And um, when I coach the ladies in high school, I have to remember that every single kid is different. And I thought that kids adjust to who I am and how I coach when I was a younger coach and growing through the years, and I've coached 12 years now, 11 to 12 years, so I've understood that each kid is different and you can't get the same reaction or get the same um, action, I should say, or the same kind of feeling and motivation and love from that kid as you can get it from another. So you have to be willing to adjust yourself and make yourself the best coach for that individual child Hmm. and make the adjustment across the board. Um, Some kids are really good with emotional and passion, and then some kids just close down. So if I was looking back, I I wish I would have known that as a younger coach to know that I had to make the adjustments, not the kids. So. Mm. Amen. I think, you know, I took over this job about six years ago, uh, and the, the coach that was before me, the person that was running the program that, that was before me, he left me with this parting shot, and he said, hey, 
try not to get too attached to the kids. And it was one thing that just kind of stuck in my head is like, okay, yeah, I have four kids of my own, and I kind of looked at him like, yeah, I'm not going to get too attached to these kids. I got my own kids, right? And I think over the years, you you wind up getting so attached to the kids and caring so much about their well-being and their accomplishments and their personal independence and their their actions off the court as much as on, and you wind up caring about them as people so much that you want to see them succeed and you want them to understand that your only mission in life is to help them through that path to success. And uh, and each one of these kids, I think that that by caring for them and really understanding that that you're there to support their needs, that makes you a stronger coach. And if I would have known that right off the bat, I could have saved myself about three years. So. <laughs> Let's stay with that because you've actually said, Trooper, you said that you define winning individually for each kid, whether it's socially, academically. Can you give us a few examples of that in terms of how you've developed a pattern of growth for them individually? I mean, I think we, it, within our program structure, we looked at it as how do we define winning? And we, we took the wins and losses right off the board. Uh, for one thing, our program, uh, we don't have a lot of wins right now. We're, we're kind of in a rebuilding phase. And so we don't want to measure the success of the program by the, the end result of whether we won or lost that season, um, you know, or the scoreboard or anything like that. We want to look at how the kids are growing independently, how the kids are are growing individually on the court and how they're growing as, as uh, individuals in society. So within our structure, when, we, when we're traveling, one of the problems within our program is, is we're the only program that serves kids with physical disabilities in a competitive atmosphere in all of Northern California. So we serve kids from Sac <laughs> Thank you. So, so we serve kids all the way from Sacramento down to, we have kids from Gilroy right now and everywhere in between. And so for, in order for them to have an opportunity to compete, these kids have to travel to Seattle, to Phoenix, to Utah, to Denver, you know, and we have to take them on trips all the time. And one of the things that we started doing was for our varsity athletes to be able to compete and be able to have that opportunity to travel, they had to be what we consider independent travelers. That means that they had to leave their parents at home. They couldn't have anybody helping them on the road. They couldn't have any help anybody, anybody helping them with personal care issues. And, and reality is uh, kids with physical disabilities kind of have that uh, a little bit more, uh, you know, sense of need in some aspects, and and not necessarily that they have the sense of need, but some of them kind of what I've found out is they milk that sense of need, right? <laughs> and we have a group of overprotective parents that will play into it, and you have a paraplegic that can fully go on and be on his own, and the mom will want to push them into the gym, or the wanna, mom will want to push them somewhere else, and you kind of draw that line and go, no, they're just like any other athlete. If they're going to be an athlete, we're going to treat them like an athlete, okay? And so when they go on the road, they have to take care of their equipment, and, and I think Courtney, one of the young ladies in the film there, has talked about pushing her game chair and her, and her everyday chair. So on the trips, you have your everyday chair like I'm pushing it now, and then you have your specialized sports equipment that you take on trips. And so they have to manage all their gear, all their equipment, wherever they go. They have to get up to the counter and present themselves to the flight attendant or flight agent to go ahead and get checked into the thing, just to develop that communication skill that they need. Because, you know, so many times the parents are, are overwhelming in doing this for them, that we want to develop these skills on their own. And so we just kind of make them take care of every aspect on the trip on their own, which is really great, because you have the rookies that come with this huge bag right, right away and, and look at you at the airport and say, are you going to carry that for me? And you're like, you're going to have fun with that, right? <laughs> you know? And, um, and luckily, you know, the whole rule Next on... Next trip, it's this size. Yeah, right? exactly. The next trip it is. It's really, really tiny. And, and the whole rule on the trips is that they, they can ask for help, but they have to be very specific with it, or else they can ask their teammates for help, but they have to be very specific with it. And their team collectively has to do it together. They all have to manage the situation together as a team. be mandatory parental guidance across all boards, by the way. Amen. Right. Amen. Right? Amen. <laughs> you have to let your kid talk, check themselves in. Right. <laughs> Ursula, you, you said earlier to PCA that basketball is life and that just about anything in life can related, be related back to basketball, which you are like singing my song, sister. So... Can you, can you tell the crowd what you mean by that? Well, I, coming from a player, um, I played in, at the collegiate level myself, and um, playing and then going into the coaching world, um, you get to see it from two different kind of aspects. Um, I, for the, um, on the record, I apologize to all my coaches for everything I've ever done. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, wow. Um, if I ever had a player like me. So, um, but seeing that kind of the foresight and the knowledge of understanding what I actually put my coaches through or what um, life lessons you have. Um, it, teamwork alone. You have to be a team. I mean, simple, simple things like working or, I mean, I tell my girls, you guys have to learn how to be functioning women. And that's what I'm, I mean, I don't want you to be calm, demure. I don't want you to be quiet. I don't want you sitting in a corner. I want you to be strong. I want you to find your voice and I want you to stand out. And, <laughs> and a lot of people, a lot of people in my world find that to be very difficult because I am loud and I, I do stand out. And um, I, I have to say, my girls take a note from me and um, there is a time and a place for everything. And there is a time to stand up and be who you are. And I learned that all through basketball. Every game day, every time I had to step up and speak to a teacher or any time I had to get on a plane like you were talking about in college and represent my college, represent something bigger than me, a name bigger than me. And that's what I really preach home to my girls, that that is what you are. It doesn't matter if you're playing a sport. It doesn't matter if you're working. You are representing something much bigger than you. And if you can get your head wrapped around that you're a part of that, then we can even get to a point where amazing things can happen on the court and off the court. So, yeah. Amen. Marion, you, you coach everything except for soccer, we figured out tonight. <laughs> it's like, why don't you coach soccer, Marion? It's like, I train them. We, you coach track and field, 150 on the track and field team, another 160 kids in the fitness program, right? You run an early morning boot camp for adults in your community. Do you sleep, by the way? Very little. <laughs> what impact do you hope that you have on your community? I want to be that guy that, that doesn't really talk a lot, that just kind of walks the walk. Um, I'm, like Ursula said, believe it or not, I'm really loud at practice, um, football practice, whatever, but I tell people I'm their biggest fan. I guess if I could do anything, I just want kids or athletes, period, to believe in themselves. and. I go back to the vocabulary and the words that are used. I tried to find all these positive things because I have a variety of kids. I have kids from second grade to eighth grade in my middle school that I coach. I work for USA Track and Field as a trainer and a level two track coach. So I work with Olympians, I work with all kinds of different athletes and there's always this lack of communication that you've got to cross this barrier. And so I've tried to come up with just little bitty things that I can do to make a difference. So instead of reprimanding when we're not doing what we're supposed to do or when we're unsupervised and doing something, I might say, um, when does integrity matter? And then everybody will stop on our team. 150 kids will turn around and say, when it's unsupervised. Um, when we have a situation where kids are acting out, we say, when I know better, and then everyone stops, and they say, I should do better. And so that takes a lot of the, oh, you're not doing this right, or you're not doing that right, and it brings it back mm. to where we all look at ourselves, and then we can all check ourselves as coaches, too, because um, I've also learned that, going back to the first question, if I could redo it all again, would be to find a staff that is loving, nurturing, and cares about the kids before and after practice. Mm. And if you can find those kind of people to be on your crew and they're not worried about, oh, I'm the head coach, I'm the assistant coach or whatever, but just to find this little family of people that you can make a big difference in the world. Yeah. You, you need it in everything in life, don't you? Yes, ma'am. So true. Pete, you and I had the pleasure last year of listening to Joe Ehrman, who, who won the Lifetime Achievement Award, talk. Um, and, and if you haven't seen, seen that speech, I highly recommend you go check it out on, on video because it's amazing. But I know that he's had a, a great influence on you, and especially, and we saw it in the video, the, the Men Built for Others program. How has that influenced your coaching? 
Well, I think, again, it goes back to what I was talking about before, about the love and, uh, you know, kids, again, about being in a relationship with each other, loving each other, caring about each other. You're not always going to like each other. You know, we all make mistakes. Um, so, you know, but the love seems to cover all that, mm -hmm. you know, when we do make mistakes. So, um, in terms of the men built for others, one of the things that we try to do as a coaching staff is we have pregame meals every week before the games. And we talk about issues that deal with young teenage boys. Young teenage boys are, they're an animal that, you know, it's just, they're different, you know? And so, but I, uh, I absolutely love them. I just love hanging out with them. They make, you know, of course they keep me young. Uh, but anyways, uh, but at our pregame meals, I mean, there's no topic that isn't broached. And so we, we, we talk about everything. We talk about, you know, what does it mean to be a real man? We talk about how to, you know, how to treat women correctly. Uh, you know, how to treat your parents correctly. Um, <laughs> I mean, those are lessons that I had to learn as well. And my wife's in the audience. She'll vouch for that. But, uh, <laughs> but um, uh, you know, and then, do, and then the you, big thing. Do you, do you yeah. like, throw those out, or is that just, like, free-flowing conversation? Um, it's <clears throat> sometimes the kids talk about it a little bit, and all the coaches will give little. It's not like we're preparing speeches. Coaches just get up and give talks about different, these different topics. And so it, it's really cool. It's, it's amazing what happens in that room. There's nobody in that room. The parents are awesome. They feed us, and then they get out. And now it's just us. <laughs> and and what, you know, what's, what's said in the room stays in the room, I, you know, for the most part. So. And, you know, again, what does it mean to be a man built for others? It, you're talking about what does it mean to be a real man? Does that mean, you know, you're the guy that gets all the girls? No, that's not being a real man. Are you the guy with all the toys at the end, with all the, you know, big house, big car? No, that does, that's meaningless, right? So uh, in the end. Uh, so... Um, those are the kinds of things we talk about, just um, those issues with young boys. Because, you know, they don't get it. I mean, sometimes they get it from parents, and that's great. Sometimes they get it from other people. But I know I can deliver that message to those young men because I'm the football coach, and they're my football players. Right. And so I love them. Oh, gosh. That is awesome. When, when I was reading through all the different testimonials, because people write in and give examples, of course, for all these different coaches. And so I'm reading through all the testimonials, and which I don't know if you guys have seen them, but they're, you really, it should, it should be reading that you get to, to view as well, because it's, it's beautiful stuff. And, and one of the things that uh, one of the players uh, from Pete's team, football players, said is, um, we, we used to ask coach, you know, how good is this team compared to others? Or how good is this team? And are we good? And his response is, I'll tell you in 20 years. And I thought, oh my God, I like started crying. I was like, I love that. Like, I, I want to see what, what men you become. So uh, that's really neat. Okay, couple, do we have time for a couple speed rounders? At least one. One, okay. I'm going to choose my best one. Um, Okay, this is a good one, because it's been a theme. Speed round. Pete, we're starting with you again. What advice do you have for coaches about how to positively involve parents in their program? I do like that you kicked your parents out, so that might be advice. Uh, that's the only time we kick them out. That's the only time. We, we, parents are awesome. You know, they really are. They, and here's the thing with parents. They love their children, yeah. and that's a good thing. You know, I mean... So um, we get that, and uh, probably the advice, uh, let, let them advocate for themselves. You know, let your kids advocate for themselves, and they'll do a better job than if you advocate for them. Yeah. Marion, do you want that one as well? I work at a small Catholic private school. <laughs> in an affluent neighborhood where kids get to go to trainers from third grade <laughs> for a couple hours a week. And I would say to parents, let your kids play. Yeah. Let your kids have some fun. Um, 
don't make him just be a baseball, basketball, football player in the third grade. Give him the opportunity to go out and develop their whole being. Because when you cut them off from their whole being, and I got a chance to ride in with Coach <laughs> Ursula, and we talked about a lot of different things. So it would be great if we could coach at an orphanage sometime. <laughs> um, I didn't say that out loud. Um, oh, that would be the quote to, of the night right there. I'd have to go back to what Pete said was, <laughs> let them have a voice. Um, let them have a voice. Let them advocate for themselves, um, especially once they start getting to middle school and high school. Because right now, working with the athletes that I work with, and I talked to Ursula about this, and this may seem kind of off, but right now you've got the college coaches dealing with mom and dad over middle school issues. Let the kids talk yeah. for themselves. Ask them what they want to do and ask them what they like. And then ask them every so often what we said in that, what was said earlier. Are you having fun? That's yeah. what I would think. Yeah. <laughs> I know that uh, I speak for everyone in the audience, coaches, parents, people who have advocated for the Positive Coaching Alliance when I say thank you to the four of you for all that you give on a daily basis to all these young people around the country. So thank you. And, and Marion, before, before we give the stage up, I think we should do like a big group cheer because I know this is like your thing. Can you get him like Chan something? Yeah, I'll give you one. Come on. Okay, so uh, in the film, I've been saying this for years, but in the film you saw um, we gather up in the evening. This is, I do this even with, with the collegiate athletes, and um, I'll say, when, what do we need? When good, in good times and bad times, what do we need? And then they say, and you'll say, each other. In good times and bad times, who do we need? Each other! For what? In encouraging words. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. We got to do it right. One more time. Okay. Encouraging words. In good words. times and bad times, who do we need? Each, Each other. For what? Encouraging, encouraging words. words. My encouraging words are usually never, ever give up. Yeah.